All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second talk of the OCHS Virtual Winter Speaker Series. My name is Ben Falter. I'm the Director of Education at the Ontario County Historical Society in Canandaigua, New York. With me today is Michael Galvin uh, from the Ganondigan State Historic Site. Before I turn things over to Michael, I have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first, this speaker series highlights cloth and textiles to coincide with our current exhibit, Fibers of Our Lives. If you have not already visited the exhibit, it will be closing in late April 2023 to make way for our next annual exhibit. So if you are in the Canandaigua area, I would definitely highly recommend uh, you come by the Ontario County Historical Society to check it out. Uh, information about the Historical Society can be found on our website, and you should be able to find the link to our website in the description of this talk. And if you have not already looked into the remaining two talks in this speaker series, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, and you can find all the information about our upcoming talks on our website as well. I'd also like to thank our exhibit sponsors, Canandaigua National Bank, Cats in the Kitchen, Lazy Acre Alpacas, and Peaceful Seams Quilt Shop for their continued support of the Historical Society and what we do. And of course, thank you for tuning in this afternoon. If you have any questions or comments during the talk, you may type them in the live chat, and I will pass them on to our speaker during the Q&A period at the end of the talk. You may access video playback of this talk after it concludes from the same link that you are using to tune in right now. But without further ado, allow me to briefly introduce our speaker this afternoon. Uh, Michael Galbin is the executive director of the Ganondigan State Historic Site in Victor, New York. Ganondigan is a national historic landmark and the only historic site in New York dedicated to a Native American theme. Ganondigan's grounds span 569 acres and include walking trails, a full-size Seneca Bark longhouse reflecting a typical Seneca family longhouse of the 17th century, the Seneca Art and Culture Center, which tells the story of Haudenosaunee contributions to art, culture, and society, and much more. But with that, I will go ahead and turn things over to Michael. So go ahead and take Thank it you. away. Thank you so much, Benjamin. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here and uh, share some thoughts and, and ideas with your uh, or organization and, and folks tuning in. Um, I guess I'm going to start this d discussion uh, really to kind of frame and focus my talk because I guess historically it's it's uh, we could talk historically about um, what would be like at the moment of European contact or just before like what was going on in amongst Haudenosaunee people um, at the time in terms of, of cloth or fabric or textiles, right? And I thought that would be okay, um, but we're limited in that respect because um, we, the, you know, much of what we know about textile traditions and history amongst native people, um, I mean, it, a lot of it comes from oral history, right? But also it comes from an archeological context and because, you know, plant material, things like wood, leather, fiber, right? Those are, um, they're fragile, they're fragile objects and they don't last long in the ground. And so you really are limited in what you can talk about textiles because they don't, they no longer exist. And particularly amongst Haudenosaunee, people and territories, like there isn't a dry cave where you might find some of those textiles remaining from long before European contact, right? A lot of it's missing um, and gone. So we start to see and learn about actual textile production and weaving and and, and that those traditions of, you know, plant fiber traditions as soon as European arrival because um, people had a custom of putting their belongings into brass kettles and then interring them with their loved ones when they were buried. And so the um, copper salts preserved some of the natural materials like wood and leather and fiber, plant, plant fibers and textiles. And so you only know, I guess, archeologically speaking about you know, material only survives after that. You can look at though, 
some textile traditions from impressions. And there was a, a tradition of using textile to create um, impressions in pottery in some cases. So you can literally see the woven areas because they pressed the fabric or the textiles into the clay when making a clay pot. And so you, you could see that there too. But I thought now let's let's focus on, on a historic period, right? So we'll, we'll call it the colonial period. Um, we'll say the late 17th century until the um, end of the 18th century. So like a hundred year period. Let's look at what textiles were um, in native communities. Um, what were their preferences and, and what they do with them, you know? And I thought that would be good because we're approaching the um, uh, commemorative years, the American Revolution. I thought that might, might be the best place to focus our my talk. So that's what I did for you. I, did, I decided not to do the early period. I decided to do like a, you know, more um, contemporary time period. So what I'm going to share with you is a, a presentation, which is very long, but I, I'm going to only do part of it um, about clothing traditions of the 18th century amongst the uh, woodland people, including the Haudenosaunee, okay? So let me get, get that up and started. So I'm hoping that you can see this. I'm just gonna trust that you can. <laughs> so we're talking about the last half of the 18th century which is, you know, about the middle of that century, so 1750s, actually till 1800s, so right around that time period. Um, and information about that time period, even though it's a much more contemporary time, is still very limited, actually. And, and so there's not a huge amount of clothing that has survived from that time period, indigenous clothing. It's surprising, but um, I've been able to kind of... Uh, put together this presentation of most of the known 18th century pieces of clothing that exist, most of them. There's some that are not included, but but we're gonna look at most of them. And I've broken it down into segments. So typically the mid 18th century um, is a period where indigenous people have absolutely incorporated European uh, raw materials into their own um, material culture. I'm getting a phone call and I'm going to have to hang up on them. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and so they've incorporated European textiles. So what I'm talking about is woven goods. Um, woolens is the most important and most um, uh, desired by Native people, but then also cotton and, and linen and silk even. Um, this material is coming through an economic system that people have referred to as the fur trade, right? But I think it's that's not the best characterization of that time and what was going on. I think it's just simpler to say that there were uh, stores that were available to native consumers and they could purchase materials there with um, basically a form of money, right? Um, hold on one second. I have to pause here. I'm sorry. No worries, no worries whatsoever. Uh, I'll just take this moment to let people watching, uh, know that, uh, of course, if you have any questions during the length of this talk, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat. Um, and, uh, you know, time uh, allowing at the end of the talk, we will, um, you know, I will ask Michael those questions that you may have. So, uh, yeah, if you feel free to, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat at any point, and I will keep track of them and ask Michael at the end. Sorry, there's an emergency alert <laughs> that oh, was no coming worries. through. You may have gotten it too, <laughs> Benjamin. Um, yeah, anyways. Will. Um, so, uh, so this, this time period, which we call the fur trade and this economy was founded on furs was more or less a, um, you could think of these furs as money, literally each fur had a, had a value 
and then they had comparative values depending on the quality of that fur and then the, the species, species of the animal that the fur came from. Um, the beaver was the standard. Okay, so a beaver, one good beaver hide in season, quote unquote, had a, had a base value and other furs had a value based on that. So like a bear skin might fluctuate between two and three beavers worth. Um, minks, it, you know, standardized, they kind of settled it around four minks per beaver. So goods and uh, raw materials at the store, we're talking Albany, Montreal, would have a value in beaver. So we'll say a yard of red fabric or red woolen fabric might cost one beaver, right? So you could, um, you know, make up that the, the value of the beaver in mink or fox or whatever it is that you're, um, you know, you have with you. And so it's really more of a, just a consumer <clears throat> system uh, typical consumer and monetary system than it is any kind of a real trade system. I mean, trading is happening, but it's, I think that when people say trade, it, it is, there's a sort of like primitive connotation behind it. And that's not really what was going on. Um, Native people often bought on credit and uh, did all kinds of um, you could, uh, like uh, transactions with these uh, store owners and families of traders. Um, which would be surprising to you, actually. Um, anyways, so out of all those traded goods, turns out that more than half, just over half, was textiles. And of those textiles, it was woolens that made up the, the majority of the um, textiles that Native people were consuming and purchasing. Now, they were buying raw materials, but they also bought already completed clothing, and within that category of textiles could be blanketing too. So there was a wide variety of textile, you know, raw, you know, bolts of cloth, wool, whatever, um, finished garments, coats and shirts, uh, even leggings were, were uh, purchased already made in some cases. Um, and then actually uh, European garments. <laughs> so like, full suits and waistcoats, vests and jackets, a full suit or shoes and things like that, stockings even. Um, but we're gonna focus on the, the indigenous produced garments using European materials. So the European materials in particular wool was, you know, was very desired, not just because of its vibrant color quality right but also because it had a practical it had practical benefit too wool is an exceptionally um uh, um insulating um fabric even though it gets wet it kind of retains a lot of its um like heat storing qualities and so in a practical sense it it's really desirable so what we're looking at here is a pretty it's a fair approximation of what people might have worn in the middle of the 18th century. So we'll start with the woman. I mean, actually, we're going to start with the, uh, I think we're going to start with the men, actually. Yeah, we're going to look at the leggings or or um, what Mohawk people say are gaulis. Um Stockings are leggings. Today, it means sock, but long ago, it was the leggings. So what are leggings? Leggings are... Uh, tubes of fabric and they're held up by two straps that would connect to a waistband and that waistband could be a length of leather uh, could be a woolen sash could be a lot of things but that's how they were they they were made and that's how they stayed up they were separate so it's like pants with no middle um, most times these leggings in the 18th century were decorated uh, in some way. Of course, there were obviously plain ones, but the ones that exist that have survived over over the last two and a half centuries are decorated. They typically are worn so that the the place where the fabric is connected on the side appears on the side of the leg as a flap. And so going back, you can see this 
part of the leg is the flap. And you'll also notice that the leggings are very fitted to the owner. And that's typical of this, of the interest at that time period in um, following the contour of the leg. And the same thing with the woman, although hers are covered up mostly with her skirt, but her leggings would, would go up to the same, the same height on her body and seamed on the side with that kind of tight fitting um, style. <clears throat> and so this is a pair of leggings that was collected in the 1780s um, by a man named Sir William uh, Caldwell, I'm sorry, Sir John Caldwell. And it's plain woven, red wool fabric. And when I say plain woven, it means that it's just a simple over and under weave. There's no twill or pattern to it. It's just plain. And then you can kind of see the contour of the seam in the photo a little bit, running over the calf, coming in at the knee, and then expanding out along the um, lower thigh. And it's trimmed in another type of textile, which is silk ribbon. Um, the straps are woolen twill tape, which is um, serves a lot of different functions. It can be a binder on other fabrics, or it can be used as a strap or even a garter. This is the same pair, just with a different background. It gives you a different appearance and kind of gives you a little better sense of maybe the color. Um, on the bottom, this pair is really interesting because they have, these are broken now, but that was a stirrup of the same uh, woolen tape that you, is used to hold the leggings up, but it was a, a stirrup. So like I remember when my sister was little and she had stirrup pants that would go underneath the um, the foot and hold the legging down. And in her case, it was her stockings, holding them down and um, keeping them nice and tight. These actually have, uh, in order to be really tight to the ankle, they actually have on the inside, I hope I have a slide of it. Um, I guess I don't. But on the inside here, they have hook and eye um, closures. So this is open from about the middle of the calf down. And so it allows you to put your foot in there and get it around and outside and then close up the legging tight to the ankle. And then the stirrup here would keep it held down. And then you could wear your moccasins and that would be actually, the legging would be tucked into the moccasin um, nicely. And you would then kind of close up the flaps of the moccasins around your legging. And that prevented anything from um, getting inside your moccasins and creating some kind of irritation. On the other side are his, he had another pair which are made of leather. And so that's what these are. This is the leather pair. And even though it's leather and black dyed, probably with something like walnut hulls to get it nice and, and black, it's even trimmed out in this kind of patterned silk ribbon on the flap. And at the top, it's really interesting. You can see this kind of scalloping going on here. Um, that's from the uh, manufacturing of the leather when it's strapped or laced to a frame during the tanning process. And so we know now looking at these that that was an, uh, an aspect of the of the material that the native people appreciated. They liked to reveal that artifact of manufacture rather than cut it off and hide it. They wanted to um, show it off and be, you know, proud of the manufacturing process. So this is another legging here. Um, same kind of red material, except that this one has at the top this white band. And I'm going to focus mainly on that. This white band is actually um, an artifact of its manufacture. And so this, this wool that was produced to make this legging was, done, was woven and out of white white threads. And so you have a white, a piece of white wool fabric initially, and then it's dyed. And during the dye process, the length of fabric is sewn down to a bar, um, like a bar of wood. 
and that's what kind of keeps the the fabric straight and then it gets dipped down into the dye and then it's pulled up and because it was kind of bound to that bar after it's dried it's that bar is it, it's unlaced from the bar and the area of undyed the undyed edge is here and on a european made garment like a a, a jacket just a core or something like that this would be removed you wouldn't want this on the garment but again like the leather legging the native aesthetic wanted to show that art the artifact of manufacture it's also evidence of the quality you know evidence of the handmade nature of the of the material and uh, and so native people actually would reveal it in some cases you can see here the actual imprint of the thread that was sewn how it was sewn to that bar still evident on that edge so sometimes you call that edge the selve edge which is like the um the bound edge of the of the cloth um it's not loose and frayed it's it's actually closed off um so they call this sometimes the selve edge or undyed selve edge another pair of leggings this time um leather uh, I'm kind of considering leather as a fabric too, in a lot of ways. Um, this is in um, in Cambridge. The dis the the uh, design here on the side, this long scalloping. It, it's important to see it in a leather form because we see the same design um, and preference in woolen examples. So I, I'm kind of using this as an example to show what you might what has informed a later period. Um, of legging using um, European woolens. Uh, this is another example of that lobing or scalloping of the legging. This is from uh, a, um, a monument in, um, in England. Uh, this is a pair of obviously green wool leggings. This is the first time we start to see patterning um, in time. Uh, patterning of the legging side and we have white glass beading going on here and then we've got these contrasted designs here within the beaded border and um, it's a little bit of a mystery unless you get up close and then you see that there's actual um, thread embroidery going on inside this you know long we'll just call it an avian form this um, dark green of thread embroidery. And then on the top, they wanted to have a contrast to that yellow silk ribbon. And so they actually painted the inside red to give it that contrast. And then of course, the, the white border kind of highlights that contrast. Another legging, this time it's opened up. So this, the seam is, is gone and it's no longer a tube, it's just flattened out but it's a great example of that kind of um, aesthetic, which is a real, a real valuing of high contrast, like between that undyed selvedge and the, the brightly red dyed wool. But here we have these flap elements with red, you know, highly contrasting the white border. And then of course the green and yellow ribbons beneath it, but creating this vibrancy, this energy. Um, the same thing on the other side. So let's get a look, closer look. So what we're looking actually is like the background is is this uh, silk ribbon, and then you have a beaded border, and then the red on the inside is actually a tiny rolled tube of wool, and it's tacked down to create that contrast. A really um, innovative, um, a real innovative technique to create that kind of vibrant um, color and on the other side you you know the much of the green silk ribbon is gone here and been eaten away but inside these diamonds are diamond shaped uh, cutouts of wool that are tacked in there to create that contrast so now we're look, look, moving into the later 18th century these are a pair of leggings collected by a an english uh, officer and we start to see the beginnings of 
cut ribbon work, which is a tradition that has lasted until this very day among some nations. Um, so what they're doing is they're taking uh, the silk ribbon and they will like, for example, here, they'll lay down um, this light blue in on first, and then they um, cut the ribbon and they fold back to create this um, sawtooth or zigzag design. And so this is called cut ribbon work. Same thing with this side. And so by layering different um, colors of that silk ribbon, you get really excellent and uh, energetic design. Um, this is the bottom of the legging. You can see this one is buttoned and this is a, a, a direct kind of adaptation of military style leggings or um, gaitered leggings that they would wear. And so these are European metal buttons with actual buttonholes made, you know, and, and bounded just like a regular buttonhole would be, but on a native legging. Uh, more of that design. And then the uh, twilled wool tape. This kind of shows you how that tape actually is attached to a waistband here down the side holding the legging up. Uh, most times leggings are held up also by a garter. So some kind of a strap around just below the knee. And you can see how they're tucked into the bottom of the moccasin here too. And again, you can see that tape and the legging and the side seam. Um, here's a pair, a single pair or a single pair, one of a pair <laughs> that um, I was lucky enough to see in Paris. And uh, this one is open. Again, it, the seam which closed it into a tube is gone. But in this case, actually, I have better images of it now. You can see the remnants of holes. And so this legging was never sewn all the way from top to bottom. It was actually tied in spots, probably with a thin silk ribbon. And so uh, it would it, it just tied, not literally sewn. Another another early pair, this one is before 1740 actually, with those artifacts of manufacture on the side here from the leather making process. These are two more later leggings of leather. And then a final pair. This is a little bit later, more like 1830, 1820 um, in the Volker Kuhn. Okay, another piece of garment here. Where am I on time? Okay, I got to hurry up here. So this is a breech cloth. Um, this is a an interesting garment. It's ubiquitous throughout North America. Um, originally, obviously, it was a, some kind of leather strip, but it's essentially a, a length of, of fabric that is worn between the legs. And this is, we'll say the front flap. And imagine that there's a strap here coming out either side. So the fabric goes, you know, over that strap, down between the legs, up the back, and then over the back side of the strap. So it kind of um, cradles, uh, cradles you and you have a front and back flap. And again, this is wool with silk tape um, on either side. This um, breech cloth has that undyed edge, but it's not on the actual edge of the selvage. It's off the selvage. And that's because the fabric was kind of folded over that bar, leaving a little bit of a hangover. Um, and that, car, that got dyed as well. Here's the back side. This is really a great uh, artifact because it tells us the length of the, of the fabric actually. So this is edge to edge, one width of that um, wool. So we can know um, a little bit more about the uh, origins of that, whether it was a complete measurement in, uh, we'll say English measure, or is it in a measured measurement on, a f on French measure, which is different. Um, they don't use the same system of inches and feet. So you could actually do a little bit of sleuthing about who made that fabric. Another example of breech cloth. This one is lined. Um, so there's a linen liner. Um, the Sometimes wool can be a little scratchy and you can imagine 
wearing a breech cloth of wool might be a little scratchy, so lining it isn't a bad idea. This was owned by another officer, an English officer. This is a very this is a very thin undyed edge, and um, so the be, because native people started to appreciate that um, design element, they started to request all kinds of different um, undyed edges, pairs of undyed edges, um, wavy edges. Um, and then some edges that were even contrasted dyed separately to create a contrasted color. So you might have a red fabric with a black dyed line. So there was all kinds of requests coming from native consumers and that was driving the, the textile market and what was actually being uh, imported from Europe. Uh, and here we see an example of someone wearing one of those breech cloths, a wide cloth in front. This is Joseph Brandt. You also see he's wearing another length of fabric around his shoulders, this mantle, this blanketing, and we'll get into that in a little bit here. This is another breech cloth. This one's really wonderfully designed, very vibrant. The color is still great on it after 250 years. Um, the white areas are beads, you know, beaded beaded areas, but it's really that brilliant red that is just so striking. There was um, even discussion in Iroquois country um, by the traders that the Haudenosaunee people, the Iroquois people had a preference for a specific type of red, which was not quite a true red. Uh, in other words, not like a cardinal red, but more of like a um, reddish orange. So a, a really red matter. So it was somewhere in between red and orange leaning on the red uh, end of that spectrum, so much that they called it Iroquois red, actually, in their ledgers. Uh, this is an example of a, a, a blue one <laughs> with a uh, undyed selvage, only visible from the backside or in this case where the silk has all been deteriorated and eaten away over time. Um, some more examples of breech claws around the world. So th these are, this is the uh, remaining, this is the, the, the shirts that remain uh, from this time period that exist in a native context. Um, so this is a shirt from Bern, Switzerland. It's probably right at the end of the 18th century, maybe a little bit after into the 1800s. Um, but the cut and the, the style of it, and even the fact that it's a printed, uh, design fabric indicates that it's an indigenous shirt. And I'll explain why. So this is another shirt, again, from that collection, Sir, Cal Sir Caldwell. Um, nearly all of the European shirts, I would venture to say all of them of the 18th century, really, are plain white fabric shirts. Shirts at that time were uh, in the European custom basically as an undergarment and uh, you wear it underneath your clothing, right? You barely see any of it. You might see the collar, maybe a little of the ruffle at the neck and the cuffs, right? Revealed from the end, from out on the end of the coat. And, but essentially it's there to protect the more expensive tailored vest and jacket um, or coat. And so, European, uh, you know, men would never would would never have an interest in fabric that had been printed because it's hidden, essentially. Printed fabrics were for curtains, <laughs> and for covering furniture, um, tablecloths, and things, not for clothing. But the indigenous um, preference was that the shirt was now an outer outer garment, and so it was actually being revealed, and so they leaned towards having shirts that were printed. So of all the indigenous shirts from the 18th century, every single one of them is actually printed. <laughs> but I will say this though, if you really compare uh, trade ledgers and um, illustrations, the overwhelming amount of shirts that native people wore were not printed, but were plain white, just like every other European man. And they were cut the same, um, they were designed the same, there was no difference between them, except that in some cases, when shirts were being made directly for the native trade, they might skimp 
and shorten the length so that, you know, if you shorten the length, say like two inches and you get a shirt every, maybe it's every two yards, I'm not really sure. You get a shirt every two yards of fabric, but you short it two inches that after, you know, 10 shirts, you've suddenly got enough to make another shirt. So you're actually like, um, kind of like making more out of the bolt of fabric than had you made them as long as every other shirt that you made for a European customer. So anyways, um, so these are collared. In this case, it has a tie that would call, tie the, tie the, the uh, neck, the collar together. They don't have buttons at the at the at the neck in this time period, but they would close the shirt with a buckle, a small brooch uh, made of silver. And uh, here's a close up of the pattern. Really excellent late eighteenth century raspberry pattern. And here's the man wearing it. So we actually saw his leggings, uh, we saw his breech cloth, and now we've seen his shirt. This is Sir John Caldwell. So this is another officer's shirt. This is Andrew Foster, who was stationed variously at Niagara and Detroit and out in Michilimackinac, if I remember correctly. So all over the Great Lakes, he was stationed. And his indigenous shirt was for a, a, a costume, an Indian costume. And they wore Indian dress in some cases because they were directly relating to native populations and they would dress the same for special occasions in some cases. So he had a, a set of uh, native clothing that he had that he had made for himself. So this fabric is an, again, another printed fabric. This case, it's like a four or five color block print, which is really exceptional. Um, but what you see here are these small brooches, these little round brooches, sometimes called buckles um, in the in the time period, they would call them shirt buckles because they would close up the collar. But again, you could, you could never predict indigenous um, fashion and aesthetics and people love them so much, they put them everywhere. And so this shirt, you know, it has over 300 of these silver buckles all over it. None of them close it <laughs> at the neck like it was intended, but they're designed, but the native, native uh, interest was in creating these big fields of shiny um, circles and they put them on shirts, they put them on breech cloths, on leggings, um, they put them on bandanas, all kinds of things. In this case, even on the cuff, which serves no function whatsoever other than just looking really awesome. And I think the last subject we're going to talk about is a match coat. So this is a really interesting garment. It comes directly from the indigenous lifestyle. People carried robes of, of uh, fur. They, they made woven rabbit skin blankets um, and, and used them as match coats. They um, sewed together um, little animals like there, uh, one guy, Louis, uh, Louis Nicholas described um, a child's blanket robe that is that was made of uh, chipmunk hides. Um, he also describes black squirrel coats. And essentially it's just a, a, a square or rectangle of, of fabric or textile. And uh, it's used in all kinds of ways. Cast over the shoulders like this guy, drawn around the body like this lady, sometimes over one shoulder, under another shoulder, under the other arm, sometimes worn around the waist. Um, you know, it's a blanket, it's a coat, it's a skirt, it's all kinds of things. So it's a very versatile garment. And native people began to make them out of European fabrics, just like everything else. So this is a really a great one with big bars of silk ribbon color. The, the uh, preference was to create these fields of color. Um, that was the, uh, the fashion of the day. This is another beautiful example of a cloth. Another match coat. This is one owned by Joseph Brandt, probably more of the, uh, an 1800s 
it is for sure an 1800s match coat, not an earlier one. But this is the showing that cut ribbon work. And a couple different ways of wearing them, you know, over the shoulder, under the arm, very common. Uh, sometimes they were, they would just take a regular blanket actually and wear it and use it the same way. This is a really early example of a girl's match coat, which is probably also a skirt as they all are. But this one is trimmed in, in uh, shell wampum beads all the way around the bottom here. Really beautiful, um, really beautiful example of this garment. And then a, a, a really rare one that's super plain, made out of wool tape and blue fabric that's, uh, that I got to see in Paris. This is a one that was made out of beaver hides. So we're looking at the skin side. On the other side of this would have all been fur, but then this is painted. Um, and you can see how the, the bars of paint and the trim and the edge resemble that uh, ribbon, the ribbon designs that uh, people were making out of European textiles. Uh, this is an example of one of those fur robes being worn. So the underside painted, if not that exact robe actually, and then over the shoulder and under. And it's, so this is a, a man named Guy Johnson. He was the Indian department agent for the, for the British government. And his partner here, David Hill, he's wearing a woolen one around his shoulders. And then here's a little doll wearing his tiny match coat and shirt. And then we see Joseph Brandt kind of making the ensemble look just spectacular. And then these are some um, St. Lawrence River Valley people putting it all together for you to see the general look of, of the period um, of the 18th century. All right, so I think I'm going to pause. I know I've run to the end of my time, but if there are any questions, um, I can I can field them. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much. You're and muted. yes, oh gosh, sorry, I unmuted for the people watching, but I forgot to unmute for you. Uh, thank you uh, so much for for that. Um, this would be the part where I remind people that they can type in questions, but I've already got a few. Uh, but if you have a question and you haven't typed one in yet, go ahead and do that while I run through some of these uh, first ones. Um, so the first one I have, uh, would love to know what was used as dye for the red wool. Uh, cochineal, matter, something else, um, any information on, on the dyes? I mean, you're right. That's probably what they used in Europe for their dye. Yeah. So cochineal and uh, European matter are probably the most common. I mean, they're the, the, the okay, so <laughs> we're going to get a little in the weeds here. So there was a community in, in England uh, known as Stroud, England, and they um, this community was well known for their vibrant red uh, fabric, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they were using similar dye um, formulas, they were getting an exceptionally red um, color. And the reason was they were using water from the Stroud River, which had a particular mineral content that worked as a mordant to kind of emphasize and and kind of enhance the brilliance of their red. So it so Stroud, England produced that red fabric. And later, just like uh, there's a there's a term for this, and I'm, it's escaping me now. But when you have a product made by a company that suddenly be, the name of the company becomes the product, like Kleenex, yeah. um, it becomes known as Stroud cloth or Stroud water cloth um, because of it. That's how you know you've made it big as a company. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> great. Uh, is uh, sorry. Yes, that's the next one. Is there any evidence of leggings being laced with eyelet holes uh, down the length of the leg? Um, <clears throat> there, the, the example that's in Paris right now is was probably not laced, but tied. Mm. So in a way, there were there were existing holes on the side, and then lace uh, silk ribbon was probably, you know fed through those two holes and then tied in the front in a small ribbon mm. and it at periodic um distances down the leg so not quite laced but sort of i guess okay great um 
And then a question about a specific pair of leggings, the pair that are in Sweden. Um, and the question is, is the decoration chain stitch embroidery? Oh, uh, so there was some, some, uh, there was a pair that I showed that has some, um, thread embroidery, mm -hmm. um, in green and it was not as cleanly done as say a chain stitch, but some parts of it looked like chain stitch. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, there was a leather pair in Sweden, if that's what you were talking about was actually what looked like thread embroidery is actually porcupine quill and it's uh these these like uh, multiple lines of porcupine quill work cool um two questions uh, about the printed shirts um were the printed shirts more expensive for native peoples and were they made of cotton or linen um Good question. Um, were they more expensive? Yes, they were more expensive it, generally, um, but th that's because the raw material was more expensive than plain uh, white or off-white uh, linen or cotton. Mm -hmm. And um, were they okay? So they were like we know that they were cotton shirts, and we know they were linen shirts. Linen shirts outnumber the the uh, cotton by by a long shot. Mm -hmm. I do not know of any. Um, fabrics that contain both like a Lindsay Woolsey or something yeah. like that. I don't know of any, none of those that I showed you have are that. Great. Um, and then, uh, uh, one other question and I, you know, you, I, I think I know the answer to it, but I'll throw it to you. Uh, what time frame were the leggings made? It all depends on which pair specifically, but broadly speaking, uh, from the middle of the 18th century to the end of the 18th century. Great. Um, okay. Uh, I don't have any other questions from the chat. I do have one quick question from me, though. At the beginning, you pointed out, um, that the pair of leggings shown in, like, that first picture you had, that there was a flap on the back of the leggings. Was there a specific purpose to that flap, or was it just fashionable? Yeah, I think it's, I think fashion is the is the answer yeah you know there's just you know we cannot account for all these elements right you know right. uh giving some kind of a sort of pragmatic rationale for right. them <laughs> yeah and we just have to come to the conclusion that people like what they like and yeah you know they don't it doesn't always have a practical yeah. reasoning <laughs> yeah i'm sure several hundred years from now historians looking at the clothing of our time will have many questions so yeah yeah <laughs> for sure well uh excellent uh thank you so much michael um and thank you everyone for tuning in hope you all enjoyed the talk and we will see you for the next one have a good right, rest thank of the you evening, folks thanks benjamin Bo